Hi, my name is Sammy, and this is the mini lecture component to our curriculum package titled, What Makes an Algorithm Fair? Fairness in the Compass Recidivism Risk Algorithm. This lecture will focus on the history of algorithms and pretrial assessment. After a person is arrested, they are given a pretrial assessment. During pretrial assessment, a pretrial agency evaluates the likelihood that the person will appear for their court date, as well as the likelihood that they will get rearrested. Pretrial assessments have several purposes. They can be used to decide if someone should be released while awaiting trial, determine recommendations for conditional release, i.e. if the person needs to be supervised, if they would benefit from treatment programs and drug screenings, or decide how much bail to post. Because pretrial assessment decisions have been found to vary widely depending on what agency does the assessment and the methods that they use, a call for explicit objective criteria led to the development of new tools and algorithms for pretrial assessment. Another issue that motivates the development of pretrial assessment tools is prison overcrowding. By promising to more accurately identify who poses a greater recidivism risk, these tools are intended to free up bed space in jails and support defendants' rights to go about their day-to-day -day lives while awaiting trial. The history of risk assessment tools can be broken into four distinct eras. The first risk assessment tools from the 1920s to 1960s, tools that use static factors in the 1970s, tools that use both static and dynamic factors from around the 1990s to 2000, and tools that use algorithms and machine learning, which have become prominent from the 2000s to the present. Risk assessment has been part of the criminal justice system since at least the 1920s. At this time, assessments were produced by social workers, psychologists, and parole officers, and were dependent mainly on judgment of these professionals. The first pretrial assessment tool was developed in 1961 with the Manhattan Bail Project created by the Vera Institute. This tool considered defendants' ties to the area, employment status, education, and prior criminal record. By using this tool, researchers at the Vera Institute could study the effects of bail on defendant behavior. They found that financial limitations led to defendants having to remain in pretrial custody because they couldn't afford bail, and that people with ties to the community showed up for their day in court, even if they were not assigned financial bail. These findings supported the bail reform movement, which argued for releasing people even if they couldn't afford bail. During the 1970s, the second era, most predictive tools only took in static factors like criminal history and the age when the defendant's first crime was committed, which meant that positive changes in a person's record couldn't be taken into account. Significantly, this meant that predictive tools only judged defendants on qualities about their history and record that they had no control over anymore. In 1982, the Rand Corporation released a report that tried to predict the likelihood that defendants would recidivate by categorizing them into risk levels. Proponents for the tool argued that it was more accurate than trained humans' intuitive methods of predicting risk. However, the tool had a false positive rate of 55% for high-rate offenders, meaning that more than half of supposed high-rate offenders were incorrectly labeled as likely to be at risk for recidivism. Despite its flaws, the RAND tool has influenced several modern-day predictive tools. The next era of risk assessment tools tries to address these flaws by considering both static and dynamic factors, such as current age, employment status, or whether someone is in treatment for drug or alcohol abuse. These tools were useful to rehabilitative models that took into account changing offender characteristics. The fourth era of risk assessment tools is the era we are currently in. Using algorithms and machine learning, these tools take an allegedly more systematic and comprehensive approach that treats offenders based on their risk factors as well as other characteristics. The proliferation of risk assessment tools has made it difficult to compare them and assess their roles in criminal justice settings. A 2003 study demonstrates that there are many different tools, all with slightly different methods of predicting risk, including different mixes of objective and subjective criteria. As such, there is no easy way to compare across different tools or evaluate their relative accuracy. In a 2020 study, researchers from UC Berkeley and Stanford found that in environments like real criminal justice settings, algorithms perform better than people in predicting if someone will be arrested for a new crime. The algorithm was accurate 90% of the time versus 60% for humans. According to the researchers, predictive algorithms can, quote, help professionals make more informed decisions. Importantly, however, when referring to humans, the study is referring to any human making a decision, 
not professionals with training and experience. Risk prediction algorithms touch almost all parts of the criminal justice system. Predictive policing algorithms have been used in facial recognition, social media monitoring, and place-based policing. In 2008, the LAPD was one of the first police forces to start working with federal agencies to explore predictive policing. They use technologies like laser to identify where gun violence is likely to occur and PredPol, which was developed by UCLA scientists in 2010 to identify crime hotspots. PredPol is now used by over 600 police departments around the world. The NYPD started testing predictive policing in 2012 with technologies such as Azavia, Key States, and PredPol, and developed their own model in 2013 to assign officers to monitor specific areas. The Chicago Police Department ran one of the biggest person-based predictive policing programs in the US by using algorithms to create a list of people most likely to commit gun violence or be a victim of it. However, their model was ineffective, targeted communities of color, and relied on arrest records too much and was phased out in January 2020. While pretrial assessment and predictive policing algorithms were developed because they were thought of as impartial and more accountable, they are far from it. Bias can creep into these algorithms at any point in the process, and algorithms are often applied to the wrong situations. For example, a model used to predict if someone will show up to their court date may be erroneously used to predict a defendant's risk of reoffense. Further, they exacerbate the racism embedded deep within the criminal justice system by perpetuating inequalities found in historical data. And even if they work as intended, they channel resources towards and promise to make more efficient systems of policing and prisons that stigmatize, oppress, and disenfranchise Black Americans and other people of color. Ultimately, a look at the over 100 year history of pretrial assessment tools reveals that the task of assessing people's pretrial conditions and predicting their behavior endures in spite of ever more elaborate assessment techniques. <laughs>